Now joining us is former FBI profile and program director of the Forensic Science Department at George Mason University, Mary Ellen O'Toole. Mary, this has so many people disturbed just because of the way Watts carried himself out prior to his arrest. He gave a series of interviews where he pushed a narrative that his family went missing. I want to actually play for you some of what he said. This house is not the same. I mean, I, last night was traumatic. Last night was, I, I can't really stay in this house again, like with nobody here. And last night, I wanted, I, I wanted that knock on the door. I wanted to see that. I wanted to see this kid just run in, run in, just, just barrel rush me and just give me a hug and knock me on the ground. But that didn't happen. Well, he mentions that he wants to see his kids give him that hug. He didn't mention his wife. Was that a telling sign for you? Well, I mean, if, if that were the whole interview, but we're only taking a look at a snippet, so it, it, it might or might not be significant, but in the totality of it, I think what's more si impressive to me or significant to me is that he talks about himself in that snippet. Um, there really is very little about, as you say, the wife and the children, but there is a, a noticeable absence of emotional behavior or words of emotion, like, I'm so scared, I'm so worried about them. Um, he talks about the house being empty, but that's not the same as expressions of empathy um, for his family. There's just an absence of that. You know, Watts went on to use the word nightmare to describe his ordeal, essentially saying that he was clueless as to exactly what could have happened. I want to play that for you. You know, throughout this interview, he talks a lot about the impact, as you mentioned, that it's had on him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wherever they're at, like, I have no inclination to where they're at right now. Like, I've exhausted, like, every friend that I know of, and every friend that I have has called friends that Shanann has that maybe I didn't know about. And it's just like, there's, it's like, it's vanished. Like, she's not... Like when I got home yesterday, it was like a ghost town. Like she wasn't here, kids weren't here. I have no idea like where they went. And it doesn't, it's just earth shattering. I don't feel like this is even real right now. It's like a nightmare that I just can't wake up from. A nightmare I just can't wake up from. What do you make of what you're hearing? A couple of things. He says, I know nothing. I have no idea where, where they are. So he's pushing the investigation away from him. If I don't know anything, obviously I can't have anything to do with it. And yet at the same time, throughout that interview, he talks about, I hope they're safe, but if they're not safe, I hope he comes home. But what he's doing at that point is he's calling it a nightmare without even knowing um, what happened. So it might not even Maybe they did go away and not tell him, but they still could come home, but he's already phrased it as a nightmare. So that that really is in direct conflict of, well, I don't know what happened. And then he jumps to the, the nightmare scenario. So he conflicts himself. But I do think it's important that people understand when somebody kills their own family and then they go on TV to say, but I didn't have anything to do with that, that ability to be so very sure of your own interpersonal skills that you can attempt to... Um, fool uh, a na national and international audience is very unusual. I mean, that's a lot of mm. arrogance and confidence that you could pull this off. Mm. And that's not typical. So it really goes to his sense of arrogance and his, 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 his ability, he thinks anyway, to be persuasive. Unfortunately, he was not. Is there anything, Mary, that you can read from his body language? Well, if you can see his whole body language, like looking at him right there, that's what we call a very defensive posture. That's when you see people that are um, protecting themselves. He's not open with his words seem to imply that, hey, I don't know anything, but his body is that he's hugging himself in a very defensive posture. You never look at just one element of, of their behavior or one thing that they say. You have to look at the totality. So his words seem inappropriate. His emotional state seems inappropriate. And then you've got a defensive body posture. But that in and of itself would not be, certainly be enough to uh, certainly to call into question in and of itself his guilt because we'd have to have a baseline of knowledge of how this person acts and sounds like in, in everyday life. So we're going from a TV interview. But when you combine that behavior with very likely the forensic evidence that they found at the house and then the forensic evidence they found at the crime scene, um, all of that together is what they will present in court. Mm -hmm. By itself, um, you can just make observations of the um, of him as a person. It's the forensic evidence that will be uh, very telling in this case. 
You've been in this field for a very long time. Is it surprising to you that a man with no criminal record, with what appears to be a great family situation, would do something like this? I mean, does it indicate were there financial problems? Was there a love interest? When you have a case like this, it's never one motive. It's never just financial problems. It's a combination of motives. So in this case, it could be um, the money issues. It could be a possible affair. Um, um, the mom was was pregnant and pregnancies can be very stressful in in some families so it's a combination of things it also could be hey this is not what what the kind of life that i wanted what is significant though is that all of these issues all of them even combined could have been addressed in a very pro-social way in other words borrow money from families get a divorce it could have been handled in ways uh, that did not result in murder. Mm -hmm. The fact that this individual chose murder to address these issues will be something prosecutors will very likely bring up in court to demonstrate that his thinking style is, is um, a very selfish thinking style. It's a style that um, he demonstrated prior to what he did to his family. So. Prosecutors want to show that this was not a, a result of him snapping. Yeah, just incredible. That this thinking behavior that he has demonstrated before. He could have addressed all of these issues. There's nothing these little girls did, nothing the mother did that ever could have been deserving of this. So they could, it could have been handled in a very pro-social way. It's a very extremely criminally selfish way to address your problems. That behavior pre-existed, in my opinion, likely pre-existed this crime. Mary Ellen O'Toole, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome.